<laughs> All right, tonight we're going to look at, we had a couple questions dealing with the rapture, what it is, when it's going to happen, what it does, what does it mean, and so we're going to kind of look at that tonight. Um, the word rapture does not appear in the scriptures. It's not there. But neither does the word trinity, but I believe in both of those. So there's a description of it, and basically the transliteration over the years of what it was called there, it comes from a Greek word that means to snatch up, or to grab up something quickly, or to grab something from this place and quickly move it to another place. Propazo is the Greek word. And so that was the Greek word, and how we translate that into English, we have to have a word for it. We don't run around talking about propazo. So our English word for propazo is Rapture, Hapazo, is rapture. There are three main or central passages about the rapture that we will find in the New Testament. The first is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to look at these, chapter 4, 13 through 18. Let me give you the three passages and then we'll, we'll go back and get them. The three passages, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The second central passage that helps us to understand it is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 54. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 54. The third one is in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Verses 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3. That's the one that talks about many mansions. Y'all all know that, that passage, right? All right. And so that has a passage, a part of that in there that we tie into what Jesus was saying as his reference to the rapture. So the idea of what a rapture is by the description of the term to snatch up or to, to grab something forcibly and quickly and remove it from one position. I always think of if, if you were uh, something on your carpet and you hit it with a vacuum. Okay? To me, that's what I think of when I think of rapture. Quickly, snatch that up from where it is and it's just gone. Alright? So that's what I look for. Now, this is not a product of man's imagination. And let's show. Look at that passage in 1 Thessalonians. Let's read that one first. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, 13 through 18. All right, but we do not want you to be uninformed, or that word for to be ignorant, depending on your translation, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, so as the rest who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, um, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That word caught up is the word harpazo. Will be raptured. Will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This part of the, what he was writing to the church there, they started, he had been there teaching and he had left. And they began to say, well, wait a minute, what happens to those who died? If Jesus comes again, what about the Christians who have died? Many were persecuted, killed for their faith. They're not going to get to go to heaven. And so we wrote back to them that those who have died will be the first ones who are raptured up, and then those who are alive at that point in time will go up right after them and meet the Lord in the air. And so I said, the rapture is not man's. We didn't make this up. Notice in verse 15 what he said. He got this directly from the Lord. He didn't come up with this plan. He didn't come up with this 
the dead in Christ will be raised first and then those who, who remain or are living. That, this is not Paul's <clears throat> opinion. He tells us he got this straight from the Lord. And so this is God's plan. The rapture is what God is planning to do. And there's some other precedents for the rapture when we read the Bible. A lot of times there's some pictures in the Old Testament. We had a couple of folks that got raptured out. Anybody remember them? Uh, Enoch. Enoch. The Bible yeah, said he was no. there, and then he was not. Okay. Elijah. He's in Elijah. Taken up in the description was taken up in a whirlwind. That's, just, that's just the question we pulled up. Pulled up. And so these are kind of some pictures of some examples so that to help us understand. You know, the Bible talks about scripture says that the Old Testament was written for our example to help us understand the things that is now coming uh, to be. And so this is what the Elijah and Enoch are two good ones. Most Christians do believe in the rapture. I think if you ask most Christians, they will believe it. They differ greatly on when they think it's going to happen. So I want to talk about the different opinions about when the rapture will occur, and so you can make a decision of which one you think most closely fits with Scripture. I know which one I think, and I'll probably be biased in the way that I present it, God forbid. But let's talk about some of the uh, ways that people consider. Now, does everybody know what the tribulation is? The tribulation period. Everybody know what that is? Well, let's leave the rapture out because you, you're a pre-tribber. I can tell right now. The tribulation is that seven-year period of time when God will bring judgment down upon the Gentiles. Okay? At the end of the tribulation period, the Lord Jesus Christ will come again, literally, physically, stand on the Mount of Olives, defeat the nations with the, just speaking a word from His mouth, destroy the armies, and then establish and begin the Millennial Kingdom. Tribulation is that seven-year period of divine judgment. It's the wrath of man, the wrath of Satan, and the wrath of God all boiled into one big happy seven-year period of time. That's the tribulation. Now, people differ about when the rapture is going to occur. Some people, which one did I list y'all had first? Post-trib. 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 The post means after. Some people believe that after the tribulation, after the seven years, when the Lord Jesus comes again, that's when He's going to rapture up. He's going to take those who are dead in Christ and all those who are living and take them all up to heaven right then. So it's almost as if Jesus is on His way down and He calls His church, whether they're living or dead, up to meet Him as He's coming down. That is the opinion of a post-tribber, post tribulation. Some believe that the rapture is going to happen at the midpoint. When you read through and you study the book of Revelation, we know that there's a, a critical event that's going to happen at the midpoint at the three and a half year period. That's the point in time where the Antichrist looks like he's being kind and rebuilt Jerusalem and, but he's going to break the covenant at the three and a half year and then turn and attack the Jews. And there's some other things that all start happening. That, that midpoint is very critical. Uh, it's a turning point. A lot of wrath is happening, man against man. I mean, when you start opening up and reading, you know, some of the judgments and things that are happening, you know, wars and famines and pestilence and disease, up to the point that like a third of the world's population dies within the first couple of years. So there's a lot going on. But at the midpoint, everything changes because where it looks like the Antichrist was building a new world and people were beginning to think he was the Messiah, he's going to turn against the Jewish nation and uh, attack the temple and take it over and erect a statue to himself and all sorts of things. So a lot of them think, a lot of people think that that's the point in time. That everything's going to be going along, but when we get to that midpoint, when this happens, when the covenant is broken, that's when God will call all of his church, the dead in Christ and all of those Christians who are living at that point in time. And they're called mid-trippers. And there's different variations. There are some that have it three quarters of the way. I don't know why. They, maybe they just couldn't decide between after and midpoint. 
they got all these different ones, but basically you have a post-trib, and then you have a mid-trib, that's the middle point of the tribulation. Then there's something called a partial <coughs> trib. And what these people believe is when God calls his church out, he's going to call up all the really holy righteous people. <clears throat> all the really good Christians. They get to go first. And the average run-of-the-mill average Joe Christian, he's got to wait and go up later at the end. But God is going to call up the good ones. I have a hard time with that because the Bible tells us there is none who is good, no, not one. So I'm not really sure how that distinction would be made and who would decide and if God would decide, but why would, he, why would he do that when he's already said there is neither Jew or Gentile, male or female, free or slave. He's already said there's no, no distinctions. God is no respecter of persons, the Bible tells us. So that really doesn't seem to make much sense. The fourth one is, where's my pre-tribber? Over here. My pre-tribber. Pre means what? Before. Before. Pre-trib means that you would believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation starts. Before that seven-year period of time, the Lord Jesus is going to appear in the sky. He is going to, the Lord's going to come twice, one in the sky, one on the land. The one on the land is what we call the second coming, the end of the tribulation. He's going to come for us pre-tribbers. He's going to come before the tribulation in the air and call his church up. And that's, that's what a pre-tribber believes. And then once his church is taken up and out, then the seven-year tribulation period will begin and will start. So... Let's look at pre-trib and go over some reasons why <clears throat> many commentators, many pastors, many, many authors that I trust and respect their viewpoint, I think pre-trib is the proper way based on the scriptures. So let's look at a few of them. Let's look at some of the reasons why it would appear to me, and hope maybe to you, that pre-trib makes the most sense. First of all, there is the doctrine that is taught in the New Testament, the doctrine of imminent return. Imminent return. Anybody know what that means? Jesus could come at any time. He could come at any point in time. Like a thief in the night, he could come. And matter of fact, he said he's going to come when you don't expect it, when you least expect it. Imminent return. And so that means that we have to be, as Christians, ready at all times. Because he could come at all times and call us up. Well, if it's mid-trib, we could just wait until the Antichrist makes a contract with Jerusalem and start counting three and a half years. And we know when we're getting really close. If it's post-trib, once the contract has been made and the tribulation starts, we could just count down seven years. We could almost figure out. And if you read the Bible, you'll find that not only is it, are these general terms, but they actually come down and say X number of days. When they say seven years, it is seven years. So why have a doctrine of imminent return when we could figure out when he's coming? You could just wait and get saved and, and confess him as your Lord. And you're going to, you know, I, I think it's pretty much, I got a figure right here. I got a, next Thursday is circled. So we need to get on the ball Wednesday. We've got a Bible study down there at 7 o'clock. Why don't we go down to that? Wednesday night, we'll be good. Ain't nobody going to be here. Ain't nobody be here. Well, if you're, we hope. Yeah. If you're, if you're the wrong trimmer, you might. So you could use a calendar to figure out. That kind of ruins the, the, the doctrine of imminent return, where he could come at any point in time. Even Jesus said, I don't even know when I'm coming back. That's up to the Father. That follows along with Jesus being our bride and the, and the church uh, being our groom and the church being his bride and the custom of that day that the groom would become engaged. That's what we all are now. We're engaged to Jesus Christ. We are betrothed to him, okay, which is just as binding as a real marriage. And then what would happen in that day, the groom would go back, leave the bride and go back to his father's house. And he would build a room, an addition, a room onto his father's house for them to live in. 
And then when the time got right and the room was finished, the father, that custom, would tell his son, the groom, go and get your bride now that it's ready. And he would go back and get his bride and come back and live in the house of his father. And so when the Bible talks about this imminent return and talks about using the symbolism of going and getting your bride and all of these things, we can see how it ties into the customs of that day. And it helps us to understand uh, those um, concepts of when God will send his son to go and get his bride to church. The groom doesn't always know when it's going to happen. And Jesus, particularly as he uh, um, set part of his prerogatives aside when he was here on this earth, um, if he said, I want to do the will of the Father, he's only going to do what the Father had told him or what he instructed him. So he wasn't lying when they asked him when he would come. He said, I'm not sure of the day. Only even the angels don't know. And the Father knows. And the Father will say at the, at the right point in time when that is. All right. Also, too, so imminent return. Also, too, they got the words and the promises of Jesus. For another reason why we are pre trippers Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Oops. Revelation. Now, if you remember the first three chapters of Revelation, Jesus is talking or dictating letters to his churches. And they're dealing with different issues and different things. And uh, he says, you know, I, I know what you're doing. I know what you're going through. But you need to do this. You need to repent. You need to do this. You're doing this right. You're doing this wrong. And to each of these churches, he's given this letter. Look in... Um, Chapter 3, excuse me, verse 10 and 11. Revelation 3, 10 and 11. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will, will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming quickly. That means when he comes, it's going to be fast. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Notice what he says. I am going to keep you from the hour of testing. What hour? The hour which is about to come upon the whole world. So people say, well, you know, there's time. What about this? And what about this? And what about the Spanish Inquisition? And this? What about the church went through this? Was that on the whole world? But when the tribulation happens, it will affect the whole world. That seven-year period of time will affect the entire globe. By the time that thing is over, remember, only about 20% of the world's population going into it will still be living. Because you lose a third of them right off the bat, and then when you get down later in the other later judgments, you lose 25% of what's left. It doesn't even count those who have been dying in wars and all these other things. These are coming from specific events, and especially towards the end. So Jesus says, look, I'm, I'm going to keep you from this. Church, that's who he's writing to. He's basically saying, listen, I'm coming and I'm going to snatch you out before all hell breaks loose on this earth. That's the tribulation. And again, the tribulation is a period of time of testing, wrath, judgment. Again, you got man's wrath against man. You got Satan's in there, and he's attacking mankind, and he's going after Christians and Jews. And then, uh, ultimately, you even have the wrath of God coming down on all unbelievers and all the nations that have attacked or persecuted the Jews and the Jewish nation over the years. So the question is, if what Jesus said is true, think about it. Why would the Lord deliberately and purposefully subject those whom he has loved enough to die for? And those who he has saved, why would he decide to suddenly subject them to that type of wrath? To subject them to the wrath of God. Remember, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. So it would appear for me from those two scriptures, the one from Revelation, Jesus says, listen, I'm, I'm taking you out. 
I'm not going to make you, I'm going to keep you from having to go through that hour of testing. And from what Paul wrote in Romans, there is no condemnation. But we are um, forgiven and declared to be right with God. If we're right with God, why would God's wrath fall upon us? And so those are a couple reasons why that's the promise um, Two of the reasons why I think the, the pre-trib makes the most sense. Let me give you another one. But why I think the pre-trib makes the most logical and literal sense because it has to do with the disappearance of the church in the book of Revelation. We already mentioned in the first three chapters, um, written to the church. The word church, I think, appears like 19 times in the first three. Church, the church, the church, the church, the church. And then all through the first three chapters, right? You get to chapter 4. And chapter 4 says, <coughs> After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up! here. Come up here. Snaps. <laughs> after chapter 3, after the last verse of chapter 3, the word church does not appear again in the book of Revelation until the very last chapter until the very last. There's some references in chapter 19 uh, talking about those, the saints being in fine, uh, white fine linens. Uh, they're referred to in chapter 20 uh, as the bride of Christ. Uh, for those who wash their robes in blood, there's some references in those last couple, 19 and 20, but it's not until you get to 22, 16 that the word church appears again. What happened? How come? Well, remember from right after chapter 3, now we're dealing with the tribulation period. Why is the church not mentioned during all those other chapters when all the seals and the vile judgments and the ball judgments, are, well, how come they're not mentioned? <laughs> they ain't there. They're not, there was no reason to mention them. Now, be sure that there will be millions and millions of people who will come to know Christ during the tribulation. Remember, we got 144,000 Apostle Pauls out there that Satan can't hurt. And they're going to be preaching the gospel like, like nobody's business. And many will come. And all the stuff that will be happening, he will say, what is going on? And then there will be faithful people going, well, look, it told you it was going to happen. This is what's happening. Yeah, but it's going to say the next thing is going to be these big boulder things falling from the sky. You know, that next week when they start falling, they're going to go, I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. Many of those who come to know Christ during the tribulation, a majority of those who come to know Christ, a great and vast majority will be martyred for their faith. They will be earmarked out, and by the time you get to that second half of the tribulation period, you won't be able to buy groceries, gas, heat, food, anything. Nothing. You will not be able to purchase. You will not be able to pay rent. You will not be able to live somewhere because you pay the mortgage. You pay, can't pay taxes. Nothing. Because the only way to do so is to take the mark of the beast. You have to take the 6-6 number. We know now it would probably be an encoded chip in your forehead or in your arm. When they wrote that in Revelation, people used to scoff. Ha! I don't know. That's just gibberish. No, it ain't gibberish now, is it? It's already happened. So you have to have the mark of the beast in order to, because he controls the economy of the world and the, and the military is for the most part of the world. And you will have to have that. And when you don't have it, you will either die or starve or you'll go somewhere and they will beep you walking past the scanner. And when you don't go off, they will know you don't have the mark of the beast and you will be arrested and killed. And there's a good chance there will actually be bounties out on non-believers, on unbelievers, right? Sounds like right now. <laughs> so in the way that we see some governments attacking Christianity today, and we see some ethnic groups attacking Christianity today, can you imagine what that would be like worldwide? And to them it's ethnic cleansing. If 
post that's coming. So the church has been called up. The church has been snatched up out of the way. And there with the Lord. And if you read through the Bible, we get to chapter 19 in the, in the Bible in Revelation, you find out that what's going to get ready to happen. Now you got the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, stuff is, all hell is breaking loose down there. We don't have to go through that. Unless you're a post-tribber. All those pre-tribbers are all going to be up at the marriage supper. Being betrothed and married to the Lord Jesus Christ in the great grand banquet. That will include even the Old Testament saints. And all will be there. And then in verse, then we find out in verse, uh, end of verse 19, that's when the, then the Lord comes down. So you got the marriage supper, and then the Lord kind of excuses himself from this wonderful feast that might last, I don't know, centuries. He excuses himself. He's got a little business to handle. And he comes down to this earth and stands on the Mount of Olives and will split in half. And then we have the Battle of Armageddon with just the word of his mouth. He created everything by his word. Let it be. Let there be. Now he's just going to say, let there not be. And the armies, one fire shot, will be destroyed. So the marriage supper, that's going on. Then you're going to have the, uh, the Lord coming again. But notice when that happens, when he comes again, who comes with him? The church. The church. 1914. I would have marked Revelation, but I'm going to keep going back to it. Well, starting at 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, capital letters. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems, crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called what? The Word of God. The Word of God. Who is the Word? Who did John say is the Word? In the beginning? Jesus in the beginning was the Word. He is the Word, this, this rider. And again, remember, he is having a vision to help describe what's going to happen in the future. If he has seen a vision of Jesus riding in on a fighter pilot driven plane or, or in a submarine, he would have had no clue what those things were. But a conquering general would be on a giant, the biggest, whitest horse that you could possibly have. And this is who we saw. And then he says, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Notice that it said that when he comes, the armies which are in heaven, clothed in linen, white and clean, in verse 14, were following him on white horses. Skip that one for emphasis so we go back to it. He's coming, and he's going to issue judgment, and this is all going to happen, but he's bringing his armies with him. And people have sort of said, well, this is the angels. Well, there's going to be angels that come with the Lord. The Lord doesn't go anywhere without angels. There's, but that's not who he's talking about there because earlier on he talked about the saints as being the ones who had on the white fine linen describing them. So then when he turns around a few verses later and says, you know, the ones with the white fine linens, that's the saints, that's the church. So again, it doesn't make much sense if you're a post-tripper that the Lord would leave the wedding feast, supper, there's only him there because the saints are still down on earth. And then he calls them up, and they're half they're coming up, and he comes down and says, wait, 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 wait. let's go back down. It wasn't much of a wedding feast or supper, was it? We would have missed it. So post-trip doesn't make any sense. Mid-trip doesn't make any sense in the way that you would actually be able to figure out the day that he's coming, his second coming. And since the Bible says, and Jesus even said he doesn't know, that doesn't make much sense either. 
and mid trip or partial trip, how do you pick out those people who are deserving to go in the first wave and who isn't? Now you're back to merit again. The Bible says that by the works of man, no one can be saved. So it's not like God has a list and see how many brownie points you got. Whether you get to go in the first wave, you better hang tight and go through the tribulation and go through his wrath. God doesn't work that way. The scriptures don't say God works that way. So you can see, really, I don't see any reason why the Lord would subject his bride to such a horrible season of wrath and judgment and condemnation. Because that's just really contrary to what the Bible teaches throughout, in particular through the New Testament. Questions? So what is the rapture? What does the rapture mean? It means to snatch up. Snatch up. Grab up. Take it out. What are the three main views? What's post? Atrium, atrium, and atrium. What's post? After the tribulation. After the tribulation. What's mid? Middle of the tribulation. Middle of the tribulation. What's pre? Before. before. That's before the tribulation. Out of all of those ones and any variations of mid and three quarter and all those sort of things, according to the scriptures as I read them and as I see them, pre trib is the only one that aligns with scripture. And you don't have to get fancy and concoct something else beyond what it says. Sometimes the easiest answers in the Bible are the ones that are most clearly given. <coughs> And when that doesn't satisfy people's opinions, they have to kind of start piecemealing and putting things together to make it say something that it doesn't. I believe we are, the Bible teaches, a pre-trib rapture. That the church will be taken up. The Lord Jesus Christ will appear in the air. When, when the Lord sends him and says, the time is right. And when that happens, the God the Father will send him. He will appear in the air with his archangels and a trumpet and sound it, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then in the blink of an eye, all Christians who are alive on this earth will instantly be taken up with them. To all of those people, all of those Christians, which then is the church. At that instant in time, it will be the entire church. All of the Christians who have died before, and all the Christians who are living. That's what the church is. All of the church will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they're not in the whole middle part of Revelation. They're all with Him. And then all this other stuff, we have scenes and visions of things going on in heaven and going on on earth, but the church is not mentioned on earth at all until the end of the book of Revelation when He comes with His saints and brings them back to establish, well, first the millennial kingdom, and then after that is over, then eternity. Sense? How many pre-tribbers do we have? All of them. If you weren't teaching pre-trib, we'd have a deacon to be out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you how you could not. You, it's so obvious with the scriptures. How you get around those things? How do they even come up with that? There is teaching? there is some scripture people use, but it doesn't match up with other stuff. Yeah. The best way to explain scripture is with other scriptures. When you run across a passage and you're having a hard time making sense of it, if you think you know, but then you go, well, wait a minute, but that doesn't jive with this, this, and this. That means you're wrong in your first assumption. You've got to figure out, well, it doesn't, must not really mean that. It must mean something else. It's out of context. It's out of context. And God's not going to make a mistake. People have spent thousands of years trying to catch God in, a, in an error in his word, and they haven't been able to do it. The only thing they can do is just add another billion years and explain it away. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for the, uh, the scriptures that you have given to us. And Lord, it helps to assure us and guarantee to us and comfort us in knowing that when we die, yes, we will be with you. And should the tribulation period start next week. Lord, based on your word and your promises, uh, we believe that you will draw us out and pull us to yourself uh, before that event. 
that keep us from the hour of testing, the hour of wrath, because you love us and you died for us and we are your bride. So Lord God, thank you so much for the gifts that you have continued to give us, but the gift of faith that is made possible in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. <coughs>